Good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, I'm Jonathan. I'm hosting the Wellerton Project podcast for this week. I'm joined by Harry. He's joined hello. us. Hello. Uh, hello. Hello. Yep. Good to be here. I'm also joined by Matt Ridley. Uh, hello. Hello, Matt. Good afternoon. Good day. Good morning. Good. Good. Good everything. <laughs> yes, we, we tend to release this uh, as a as a recording, so it doesn't. Uh, the guy who normally hosts it has decided that we're greeting everyone with whatever time of day that they're listening to this at. That's so, it. Uh, there's a worldwide audience as well, so exactly. <laughs> kind of makes so, sense with that. Matt is a journalist, businessman, former conservative peer, and author of many books on science and innovation over the past few decades. His most recent book is on is called Viral: The Search for Co the Origin of COVID nineteen co-author with Alina Chan, and we'll be talking about that in a minute. He's also written How Innovation Works, which I'm currently reading. It's very good, do recommend. And the entire idea for me to contact you was actually uh, me recommending the evolution of everything. Uh, so I recommended this book several times, but I actually recommended and then lent my copy of it to my girlfriend, who since waltzed off with it. So <laughs> yeah. the one time I, le I lend my book out, I actually we actually end up with a she chance to talk to you. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, <good for you. laughs> yeah, she, she, uh, she, she lives, she lives in Wales, so she's gone off back to Wales with it. Excellent. Um, well, um, the evolution of everything didn't sell very well. Um, so those people who like it are a small but select group of excellent connoisseurs. <laughs> well, that's both of us then. So yes, <laughs> take that. <laughs> So I guess, well, first of all, thank you very much for joining us. I know you're obviously a busy man. Um, it's very good to have you here with us. Um, and I guess before we get started, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, our latest article by John, who is an accountant, he's uncovered some astonishing numbers that he's not a fan of and we're not a fan of that shows how the government is, in our minds, unfairly, uh, charitably, disproportionately, taxing couples with a single income. So for example, if the net household income is £100,000 from a man, just, just well, one of them, I suppose, just one of them, they are taxed significantly more as if both of them earned £50,000 between them. Um, this obviously will incentivize both members of the couple to work. And John, John doesn't think this is right. So he's written that article and I encourage everyone to go and read it. Anything else to add to that, Harry? Uh, no, I think uh, I think we can just get into it. Cool. So I guess the first thing we wanted to to look at, I mean, it's starting to become less topical, but uh, is about COVID nineteen. We're going to try and avoid you, the YouTube algorithm here. Um, the origin of it is something that you've been researching quite a lot, Matt, over the past couple of years. Um, I've I've just been watching the uh, testimony that you gave to the UK Parliament Commission or committee. Mm -hmm. The story about the origin of it has changed many times, and I guess it's been hard for a lot of a lot of people to keep track of. So, could you give us a sort of brief rundown on on what your research has uncovered there? Yes, I will. Um, I got intrigued uh, when this broke out as to where it had come from, um, and uh, at the first, everybody said it came out of that market in Wuhan, uh, and that like SARS, it would have been brought from a bat because we know that all these SARS like coronaviruses are are in bats. Um, they would have been fraught, bought from a bat by a, a, an animal that people eat for food. That's what happened in the case of SARS 20 years ago. But as the months went by and I was looking into this and accepting that was the likely route, um, several things began to happen. First of all, it turned out that they couldn't find an infected animal in the market. That was surprising. They found them very quickly in the case of SARS. Um, they couldn't find any other evidence like antibodies in vendors in the market or anything um, and at the same time a paper was produced showing that actually this virus was very well adapted to human infection from the very start unlike SARS and that raised the possibility that it had actually been in human cells in a laboratory um, over the preceding months or years now that uh, that option had been ruled out by uh, virologists quite early on but we now know, we later found out, that in private they didn't think it could be ruled out at all. In fact, they thought it was quite likely, uh, not only that it had been in the laboratory, that it might have been manipulated in there. So I teamed up with the person who did the work showing that this virus was well adapted to human beings. 
uh, to write a book um, chronicling all the evidence that points to the market, all the evidence that points to the laboratory, all the dead ends and twists and turns in this over the succeeding year or two, um, turned into a fascinating who done it. Um, and we don't know the answer. We still don't know the answer. We finished the book and published it with a, um, a, 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 a deliberate laying out the evidence for the reader to make up their own mind. We both think a laboratory leak is more likely than the market now, uh, based on the evidence we've got, based on the um, details of the genome of the virus, based on the uh, fact of how much uh, research was going on in Wuhan more than anywhere else in the world on these kinds of viruses. Um, there was a bigger collection of viruses than uh, of these viruses there than anywhere else. Um, and so it's a bit like what happened in 2007 when there was an outbreak of foot and mouth disease a few miles from the laboratory that was the world's leading reference laboratory for foot and mouth disease in Purbright. And nobody said, oh, that's just a coincidence. They said, hang on, we better look at what's been going on in the lab. Have you had a leak? And it turned out they had. So um, we've had zero cooperation from the Chinese government, Chinese scientists, um, but through the work of an ex some, some extraordinary people who've been able to get hold of documents on the Chinese websites, um, we have actually been able to piece together what was going on in that lab, what they were thinking, what they were up to, and, and why they were doing it, um, and presented that evidence, but also presented the evidence that it might have been in the market. It's very important we find out, because if we don't find out, we might be taking the right measures to prevent the next pandemic. Very, very true. I, I was going to uh, point out as well, you say at first it was out, out of the question that it came out of a lab um, by some people, but behind closed doors, it sounds like they were quite suspect of that. I, I mean, what, what made them hide that, in, hide that fact? Or uh... Uh, The virologists in question were um, mm. worried about two or three things. First of all, on the American side of, of the, there was a key phone call on the 1st of February 2020 between Jeremy Farrer of the Wellcome Trust in London and uh, Anthony Fauci, the US government's medical advisor, Francis Collins, the um, uh, head of the National Institutes of Health, and about 10 other scientists. And on that call, several of them went into that call saying, we've had a first look at the genome of this new virus. It looks horribly like it's been manipulated in the lab. It's got a feature in it called the furin cleavage site, which makes it very infectious, which doesn't occur naturally in SARS like coronaviruses or hasn't so far, um, and which biologists have been putting into viruses to make them easier to grow in the lab. Um, so uh, we, hor we horribly fear that it might, that might be what's happened in this case. Why did they then, within three days, start drafting an article saying we can rule that possibility out altogether? Um, basically because they had been funding some of this work in Wuhan. They were embarrassed about that. Um, they were worried that the blowback to the reputation of science, to their funding, to the regulations around their experiments would be um, stricter. Um, uh, and they also, of course, in the back of their mind, and this comes across in some of their um, emails, uh, they didn't want to rock the boat with the, the Chinese who were um, mm. uh, collaborating with them and contributing significant funds to some of their labs. Um, and they particularly didn't want Donald Trump to be right about something. <laughs> that, that was a, yeah, that was a classic between 2016 and 2020. But then it, it turns out a lot of what Donald Trump said uh, <laughs> tends to have some truth to it. Um, well, it, yeah, he, wasn't, he wasn't right about everything by any means. True, uh, true. Know, didn't, didn't agree with him on a lot of things, but it, it's not impossible that he was right mm -hmm. to suspect that this this was yeah. uh, connected with that laboratory in it, Wuhan. It seems totally mm -hmm. strange to... So if you get a disease that appears a few miles from a large research centre studying that disease... It seems wild to me that you'd throw throw out the possibility that it came from that that lab, just on the it, face of it. Well, the argument, yeah, the argument that they made is that all previous epidemics have come from nature. We haven't really had one from a lab. It's not quite true. There was a 1977 flu outbreak that seems to have started with a um, faulty vaccine in a Chinese lab, 
Um, but uh, anyway, the point is, all previous epidemics have happened before the era in which we had virus hunting expeditions going out on a huge scale, collecting tens of thousands of samples from bats all over southern China, bringing them nearly 2,000 kilometers back to Wuhan, putting them in the freezer, bringing them out of the freezer, uh, sequencing their genomes, manipulating those genomes, hybridizing those viruses, infecting them into monkey cells, human cells, and humanized mice, that is to say mice with human genes in them, all with the aim of preventing and predicting the next pandemic. Well, they certainly didn't do that, uh, and they might indeed have caused it. Uh, and not only that, they've lost credibility by lying to the public from day three. Um, and then Fauci has obviously been quite big in America in response to the pandemic, and why anyone would trust him now that it's turned out they ruled out actually the most likely outcome of where this virus came from it's uh yeah it it, it is questionable about what, uh, how many people are actually going to trust him now in the general public i mean i don't know about politicians necessarily or people in power but it's i, I yeah. try not to get involved in u.s political rows yeah. and i also feel quite strongly that the 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 people who are most responsible if it had come out of a laboratory are the people who, in China who were doing the work. Yeah. So there's a tendency in America to turn this into a domestic political row, which I, which I try and resist. But I will just say this. He's been in that job for 30-something years. That's quite unusual uh, in a democracy. Um, and it, it, you know, it, it must lead to um, uh, a lot of people behaving in a way as to make sure they don't annoy him because he's the big paymaster of a lot of their research. Wasn't he, uh, I guess Harry can correct me on this, wasn't he essentially the villain in, in the movie that we saw? Movie? There was a film about about the uh, the, the uh, AIDS epidemic. And I'm trying to remember the name of it. I'll have to have a look up after it. Yeah. That's kind of <laughs> by, by the by. <laughs> um, he, was, he, he did play a significant role in the discovery of the, the yes. HIV virus. I don't think he's the villain in that story. Um, uh, the, the, there was a man named Robert Gallo who had a, a big feud with Luc Montagne, who was a French scientist, as to who had discovered the HIV virus first. Frankly, Montagne won that argument, and Gallo had indeed, as it were, rushed into print with a sample that he'd got from Montagne or something like that. I think I can't quite remember the details, but um, it's possible. I mean, Tony Fauci was around and involved at that time, but I personally, who and I covered some of this as a journalist at the time in the eighties, I personally didn't look on Tony Fauci as a villain. And in, in a way I still don't. I think he's, um, uh, I think he is a good scientist and he does, uh, uh, try to do a lot of good, but um, in this case, uh, I think he is letting his vested interests get in the way of looking for the truth. Yeah, which I, ideally we don't want, but uh, it, it's a problem that comes with um, kind of what, being dishonest on this scale. It, it does bring into question, it can bring into question, I should say, his previous work. Um, but if, I mean, it, but if no one had a reason to kind of look at his past work, I don't like why now when he makes a mistake. I mean, why does it matter now as well? I mean, we're coming out of the pandemic. Um, it seems anyway. It seems Shanghai though is going quite harsh on a lockdown again. Um, so, <laughs> I, I, I yes, mean, I, is that thing to say? I just take the view that um, yeah. uh, it, it looks to me like the evidence is clear that that. Um, mandatory lockdowns were a mistake they did more harm than good There's, there isn't any good evidence that they particularly saved lives versus the alternative which was to uh, rely on people's good sense to take precautionary measures and isolate and and so on with some rules but not uh, huge ones sweden florida etc haven't done any worse than um say britain or california in the, in respect of excess deaths um but the one thing we can be absolutely sure of now, I think, is that lockdowns would not stop Omicron. 
Uh, Omicron is so much more um, infectious and transmissible than uh, previous variants, um, even before you're, you're uh, symptomatic. Uh, and so um, telling everyone to stay at home and only Amazon delivery people and things like that to, to go around visiting people, I don't think that stops this virus uh, anymore. And I think that's what the Chinese are discovering. I think with their extremely draconian, really unpleasant lockdown, they were able to stop the previous variants, including, it seems, Delta, which never got going in China. But I think they're now proving in Shanghai and elsewhere that it won't work for Omicron. It does beg mm. the question as to how far the Chinese government will go if, they, uh, if they're attempting yes, to you, try and stop this and they don't want to, look, they don't want to be seen to be wrong it about would, it. Yeah, it would be a major humiliation for Xi Jinping to admit that a zero COVID strategy is impossible with this new variant. Um, but if he doesn't admit that, the uh, effect on the Chinese economy and on probably Chinese politics eventually is going to be pretty severe. Um, and I think there's a possibility that things could get very spicy in China over the next few months as as that uh, irreversible, um, uh, what's the word, unstoppable uh, object hits that immovable I can't remember the phrase. Sorry, you know what I mean. Unstoppable force, immovable object. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. The one. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah uh, Hong Kong. I, I mean, also with Omicron, um, the, the uh, its lethality seems to have dropped as well. But basically, this virus seems to have done what every virus does, which is get more infectious at the same time, get less lethal. Because uh, that seems to be a winning strategy. For, uh, well, yes and no viruses. on that. I mean, I've actually okay. been pushing a, uh, plowing a rather lonely furrow, trying to get, on the one hand, people to admit that not every virus does that, but on the other hand, to get people to say, but some viruses definitely do, and it's not a random selection. It's it's respiratory viruses of low durability that do this. That is to say, colds. There are about two hundred kinds of virus that cause the common cold. Um, uh, they're mostly rhinoviruses, some coronaviruses, some adenoviruses, uh, some influenza viruses. None of them kill you, um, basically. I mean, that's not quite true in very vulnerable and elderly people. But basically, the, the you know, of all these 200 viruses, none of them have the sort of mortality you would associate with, you know, smallpox or malaria or yellow fever or something like that. Um, and so um, why is that? Uh, and the answer, of course, is because the ones that um, transmit well but don't make you feel too sick are, are, do really well because you go out to parties, you go to work, you meet people, you're more likely to pass it on. So they spread faster than the ones that make um, uh, someone feel sick. That is not true for an insect-borne virus, uh, you know, um, or a, a yellow mm. fever or malaria. They actually want you. Uh, malaria is not a virus, but it's a, it's a disease. Um, they actually want you to be lying in a darkened room, sweating and delirious, so that you don't notice the mosquitoes zooming in on you to bite you, and because they're the ones that do the carrying to, to the next person. So there is a very clear and sophisticated theory put together by Professor Paul Ewald as to why it's only respiratory viruses that evolve towards um, uh, low virulence, but they do... And here's the, the, the sting in the tail of that story, as far as I'm concerned, and that is that there is one way to stop them evolving into uh, low virulence, and that's to allow them to transmit in a different way. And in the First World War, we did that with influenza. We said, basically, if, you're, uh, if you've got a mild case, go to a dugout and sleep it off. If you've got a, a severe case, we'll send you to a field hospital full of people and then on a crowded train uh, and then on a ferry and then back to another hospital in London. So in other words, we were saying severe cases will spread much better than uh, mild cases. And that's why the 1918 flu turned virulent in August 1918. Now, I think we've done the same with this virus for a couple of years by saying in the first few lockdowns, if you're only got mild symptoms, just stay at home. 
if you've got severe symptoms, go to hospitals and give it to the nurses and give it to the doctors and give it to the other patients, because that's what happened. There was a huge nosocomial, that is to say, um, uh, hospital-borne infection in those early months. And so I think that encouraged the virus in evolutionary terms to stay virulent far longer than it would have done. And it was only when we started opening up that we got Omicron coming along and replacing the more virulent form. That's quite a convincing theory, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, that's actually not one that I've heard before. And I guess we've been following this fairly closely for a couple yeah. of years now. Yeah, well, and, and especially... But, um, but most mm. doctors don't understand evolution. That's the problem. That You know, they kept going on about mutation. Will this thing mutate? Evolution isn't about mutation. It's about mutation plus selection. And they forget that, that there's competition between these variants. Anyway, there you go. My hobby is... <laughs> <laughs> that's very useful one, I have to say <laughs> yes I'll, I'll be looking into that one as well I guess on the topic of evolution you said that uh, evolution of everything didn't sell very well but I, I quite enjoyed it and I have been recommending it to people I guess one thing that um, struck me about that one is the idea about is a segue here uh, evolution applied to technology um, and sort of business as well I guess that leads on to how innovation works, which, as I said, I've been reading right now. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if you could summarize very briefly the thesis of that. Uh, how does innovation work in a, in, a, in a short paragraph? Yeah, well, just quickly on the evolution of technology, which you mentioned. Um, I, I'm not the first to make this argument, but actually it, it really does look evolutionary. If you look at the... At the um, uh, the way uh, the family trees of technologies, you know, the, the, you get descent with modification, as Darwin called it. You know, you, you can trace the pedigree of of all the um, gadgets and and technologies we use. You know, think of the aeroplane gradually evolving um, step by step, and then when you look at how it happens, you find that the way it happens is by um, uh, good variations, good innovations being kept and bad ones being rejected so when you get on an airplane you might think well thank goodness this has been designed by a brilliant engineer but that's a bit like saying isn't that hummingbird designed by a brilliant creator um uh, it's a sort of creationist argument because actually what happened to both the hummingbird and the airplane is that they were adapted from a previous design with a few new features and dropping a few bad features and so on all the way back to the wright brothers or to a dinosaur in the case of the hummingbird. So there really is a very close parallel in terms of selection um, in innovation and in uh, and in evolution. But the general argument I make in um, how innovation works is that this mysterious process called innovation that is absolutely vital to human prosperity has not really been fully understood before. We have you know, lots of ideas about it. We think we know about it. But actually, we don't really know why it happens to human beings and not to rabbits or rocks. We don't really know how you switch it on or switch it off or what policies you need to, to invoke. Um, and for me, it's all about freedom. If you look at what actual, what actual innovators really do, and I distinguish between innovators and inventors because Innovation means making an invention reliable, affordable, and available, which is not trivial and often very much a bigger job than inventing it in the first place. Um, but if you look at how they actually work, they they collaborate, they exchange ideas, they uh, um, uh, uh, do a lot of trial and error, um, and they uh, switch, change their minds, do a lot of serendipity, a lot of luck, um, and then they kind of evolve um, uh, their new uh, technologies. And and so freedom is the absolutely central juice of, of the process, the freedom to uh, experiment, the freedom to get it wrong, the freedom to change direction, the freedom to invest behind your ideas, the freedom to move from one country to another if you're not finding a congenial regime to be an innovator in, etc. That seems to me to be the... Um, the, the, the general theme behind most of the um, features of uh, a good innovating society. Yes, and this doesn't happen in a, in a vacuum, obviously. If you're an individual, you're not simply working um, on a single 
call it a gadget and iterating and iterating and iterating, you will have externalities, you'll have ideas from other people working on similar projects, you'll be able to combine technologies that already exist into this. I mean, we see this with, um, I mean, my background is in is in physics, and you see this with similar ideas being come across with by entirely different people in different countries at exactly the same time. It's bizarre, and it, ha and it happens continuously throughout history. And it's essentially because they are looking at the same books and have the same material available to them, and they have the same idea because of that. Absolutely right. I mean, they, there were 21 different people who uh, invented the light bulb independently around the same time. Swan in England, Lodigan in Russia, Edison in America, and so on. Um, and, you know, that's not because God reached down from the clouds and sort of implanted the idea of light bulbs in people's heads. It's because, as you say, the idea was ripe. The uh, preceding technologies, things like, um, uh, you know, glass blowing and vacuum um, uh, pumps and uh, electric light, electric electricity and lighting, you know, had all come together where it was sort of inevitable someone would invent the light bulb. You can see the process even more clearly in a more recent example, the search engine, which is the most useful invention of my lifetime. I'm old enough to have been around before search engines. I can't remember how we ever found anything before them. Um, I use them every day. Fantastic invention. And uh, yet the amazing thing about them is you know, they come into existence about 1990. Lots of people invent them, not just Google. Google's happens to come up with the best version and scoops the pool but it, you know you if Sergey Brin didn't meet Larry Page we'd still have search engines you know you can't stop them coming into existence around 1990 but if you go back into the mid 80s and read what people are saying about this thing called the internet that's about to be invented none of them see the importance of search or at least very few of them and certainly none of them see that it's going to be the most lucrative um, aspect of the internet um, uh, so there's something strange here. Looking back, it looks extraordinarily inevitable that we come up with certain technologies at certain times. Looking forward, it's not at all easy to predict them or see them coming. Um, that's an asymmetry that I still struggle to fully understand. Yes, we uh, we look back and we see so many things that people invented so late in history that could have been invented hundreds of years earlier. That are just quite simple gadgets. Are you that... sure? I'm not so sure about that, actually. Um, I, I discuss that in my book, and and I talk about wheels on suitcases, as an example, um, and <laughs> eventually conclude that well, you know, airports were smaller, porters were cheaper and more more abundant. Uh, uh, wheels would have been made of heavy cast iron and weighed more. You know, maybe. The 1980s is about the right time to start putting light aluminium wheels on the bottom of suitcases when airports have got bigger. Um, I don't know. We'll see. But uh, yes, clearly some things could have been invented earlier. But in a surprising way, uh, quite a lot of things did actually have to wait until preceding technologies had been invented before they could come into existence. Yes, I suppose the, well, light aluminium, I suppose the technology is close enough as opposed to the time when it's ripe to appear as you say about airport terminals obviously yes. airport, term airport terminals weren't, weren't in existence well not that long ago they, they first came into existence in the grand scheme of history less than a century yeah, just something like that that, that's pretty insane, actually, when you think about it. That <laughs> the, the Wright brothers were around in the sort of very early 1900s. Man on the Moon in 1969, and where are we now? And now we're trying to yeah get to Mars with SpaceX and uh, it, yeah, yeah. But, but gone. Go on, go on. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say back in, in in the 1950s, they'd had 50 years of spectacular improvements in transport. And so they thought the next 50 years was going to be about spectacular improvements in transport. But in fact, it didn't happen. We didn't get personal jetpacks, routine space travel, supersonic airliners, apart from one, um, uh, you know, etc. cetera. Um, and instead, we got uh, incredible changes in a technology that hadn't changed much in the first half of the 20th century, uh, which is computers and communication. Um, you know, my, pet, my grandparents were born with a telephone and died with a telephone but they were born before the motor car and the airplane and they died with men on the moon, you know, so they'd seen extraordinary changes in transport. I've seen extraordinary changes in computers and communications, but no changes in transport. I mean, there are drones and there are more cup holders in cars and budget airlines, 
But things go slower on the whole now than they did 50 years ago because of congestion at airports and, and also in the city. Mm. Yeah, that is, that is an interesting. And, and then, I mean, obviously, we're, we're, I mean, I suppose me and Jonathan, we're born kind of, I mean, we're mid 90s born. So we, we, we've kind of had the internet all our lives. And while we've seen massive improvements in it, we don't, none of us probably really remember old dial up modems that made noises when they were thinking i do i live in the, i lived in the countryside oh well you might i i don't know my brother tells me about it um I, <laughs> so that that might be kind of our uh i mean the internet i'm not saying the internet hasn't made improvements over the last 20 years or so but in our living memory mobile phones are just, the, big, the big thing for me i, yeah. I remember the nokia the nokia brick and oh yeah the, you know a, a smartphone yeah. that can do anything in my hands so, so i'm just wondering how but close here's... the peak of computers were are sorry go on matt Exactly. Well, that that yeah. that's the fascinating question. I think that diminishing returns is setting in in computing and communication. Um, I don't feel the need to trade in my iPhone, uh, except for the bloody battery stops working for after a while, um, <laughs> for the new model anymore. Do you see what I mean? You know, and uh, you know, I still yeah. have a MacBook Air. Yeah, it's slightly better than my. Uh, this is my fourth MacBook Air. I have them for about three years, yeah. and then. They seem to slow down and need it replacing. But, um, uh, you know, I, I, the, I'm not sure that we're going to see spectacular changes. Everyone's going on about AI and self-driving cars and things. I think the next 50 years might not be about computers and communication. I think it might be about biotech. You know, I think that might be the technology that's going to change fastest. Yes, um, I, I remember re I was reading, I've been reading the um, food section and how innovation works and, I guess I always had this idea of um, like GMO crops and genetic modification being being in existence nowadays and being generally a good thing, but I had no idea of the scale of the uh, of um, the impact that they'd had so far. I, I guess the example, I think it's just something like the final sections of the chapter. It talks about um, the fact that we now. We we could support nine billion people with less land than we used to support three billion people, which is insane yes. to me. Yeah, I think that I mean that this land sparing point that if we don't improve agricultural productivity, then we have to chop down the rainforests, etc., to feed the population, um, is uh, is a really crucial one and, and it, one it's that such a lot linear of thinking. Are... Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, um... On on the subject of computers, though, I was just thinking, you know, we might be at diminishing returns of kind of how computers classically work, but uh, quantum computing seems, I mean, that's... They're not that great. They're not. <laughs> my well, back, that I said, my, my yeah. background's in physics and the theory's yeah. all right, but actually building one is, is really, really difficult. No, but that doesn't mean a you break can't just... be made. <laughs> True. Um, um, but that, that was kind of my... What, what, what would a quantum computer be able to do for you that that a current computer can't. The one of the main things is to do with um, in cryptography. So quantum cryptography, being able to solve um, factorizing prime numbers is a big thing in cryptography with private and public keys. Well, being able to do that I, I, in parallel. I mean, I is there, there are very very specific use cases for it, not anything yeah. general. It's quite a long time since I last factorized prime numbers. If you could, if you could crack somebody's bank account with it, then maybe you'd, you'd get into it more. Well, that's where the main worry for quantum computers comes in. It does make the current way we encrypt passwords useless. Um, yeah, cryptography. <laughs> um, when sending communications by, um, so I mean, the basic thing with, with quantum mechanics is the um, Schrodinger's cat. When you look at it, it collapses into one state out of two. It's the same principle for sending communications where. If if I send you a communication, you and somebody's looked at it, then it then it's it'll be very obvious. If that makes any sense. And I remember revising for an exam in this several years ago, and I've forgotten a lot of it. I think yeah, I'm certainly struggling to keep up with you here, but it sounds fascinating. Um, I guess a question that we could come into regarding innovation is: we've talked a little bit about some of the fantastic ones we've had, and. What, how it works in general, but obviously governments and, well, I suppose mainly governments are doing a lot to stop it. And can we see any evidence of that? How, how are governments stopping it? Well, I, I 
think that there is far too much in the way of barriers to innovation. Um, uh, some of it comes from government regulation, as you say. Some of it comes from activists who are um, just opposed to technology. Uh, and some of it comes from um, rival technologies that want to put obstacles in the way of, of, of insurgents. Uh, there's lots of examples of, of all of that kind of thing. But it it does feel to me like, you know, you, you, you talk to regulators um, government regulators, and they all say, oh, no, no, we love innovation. Yeah, we want to encourage it. And you say, well, how do you encourage it? Well, what we like to do is set up a committee to discuss innovations. And well, what does your committee do? Well, it, it, it um, draws up rules for um, new technologies. Uh, well, you mean, so you put obstacles in the way of new technology. Oh, well, it's not quite like that. But actually, that is what happens. You get, and, and the problem is not that governments say no to innovations, but they take a long time to say yes. Um, so I give an example in the book of a genetically modified potato developed in Germany, which ended up taking eight years of pure bureaucratic nonsense to get approval, by the end of which time the company inventing it had said, look, forget this, I'm going to um, um, uh, America instead, where they actually might value me. Um, so uh, it, it, it again and again, the same with nuclear, same with lots of things. It's, it's just the, the sheer delays of getting decisions out of government agencies that is a big problem for innovators, in my view. And that's the one thing we could fix quite easily. But it's just not true to say we all love innovation, we all encourage it all the time. In practice, we do far too much uh, opposing of it. We, we let... Uh, you know, there's a very good example uh, in my book, James Dyson, the inventor of the bagless vacuum cleaner. Um, the European Commission was coming up with rules to um, uh, limit the amount of power used by vacuum cleaners. And uh, the German manufacturers lobbied the, gov the, the commission there to say, can you set these rules um, for to be tested with no dust? Because... When there's dust, our bagged vacuum cleaners actually have to increase their power usage. And that means we would then be falling foul of your new limits. And so the European Commission set the rules to say all vacuum cleaners must be tested without dust. And um, <laughs> Dyson said, this is ridiculous. The whole point of a vacuum cleaner is to see how it works with dust. Um, so he sued and uh, he went all the way to uh, through the courts and they found against him and he managed to get hold of some of the documentation in which the, the, the judges had been lobbied by these big German companies uh, against him. So he eventually managed to get to the Euro European Court of Justice where he won. But by then something like eight years had gone by and uh, Basically, the Chinese were catching up with the technology, etc. So it's a horrific example, and it's exactly why James Dyson um, urged us to leave the European Union. Uh, it's a horrific example of, of how a really good new technology invented in Britain um, got, got at least partly stymied by um, uh, lobbying of government by rival existing technologies. No, there's also the risk that a, that a government might prescribe a specific technology that it likes um, or even do it too early. And then if something else comes along oh, later, it, it won't be allowed. Picking winners, as, as um, yes. Dieter Helm likes to say, the problem is, is that when the government tries to pick winners, losers tend to be good at picking the government. <laughs> 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 yes, that that is a good one. I mean, I've seen this in conversations about nationalizing, say, social media. Um, it's a pretty extreme example, but do you really want the government um, prescribing certain methods of communication? I'm terrified of that. I think it's a disastrous idea. Yes, um, yes there's a huge problem with social media, but just because there's a problem in the world doesn't mean the government action is the answer. Well, yeah, and I was going to bring this up with that whole Dyson story as well. It, it just seemed like such a waste of money and time. Th these people, could, these companies making Hoovers could have put their time and effort into making better Hoovers. <laughs> but instead, they have yeah. to fight these legal battles in the court. for uh, Why? Because some EU uh, bureaucrats feel like they need to do something. Um, 
Yes, but what, what was the initial yeah. reasoning re with regard to limiting the power on, on vacuum cleaners? Is it just just a nebulous uh, safety concern? Uh, no, it was uh, to save the planet. It was. It was oh right, okay. Uh, <laughs> it's the it's the classic. It's yeah. It's the same uh, similar which, reason with. There's another one track. which is. Uh, you, you'll only just be old enough to remember this, but about um, 12 years ago, governments all around the world um, suddenly mandated the um, banning of incandescent light bulbs and their replacement by compact fluorescent light bulbs. Um, I, like many people, hoarded incandescents, and I've just found a heap of them in a cupboard in my basement, which I'm never going to use because we've now got LEDs instead, which are way more efficient than either technology um, and therefore way cheaper uh, in the long run in terms of their energy usage. Um, so actually, LEDs would have come along and replaced incandescents anyway, instead of which we were forced into this ridiculous diversion into compact fluorescents, which were a terrible technology. Uh, they gave a horrible light. They switched on slowly. So if you sort of rushing to, to, to answer the doorbell in, in the dark in winter and you switch on the light in the back corridor, it doesn't come on for a second. Um, and they were genuinely uh, uh, toxic if you dropped them. They had mercury in them, so you had to basically put on a hazmat suit to clear it up. Um, most people didn't, of course, but you know, in theory you should have done. And they were very expensive. So this was a really dumb um, diversion into an inferior technology for 10 years when a better one was coming down the pike. Now, why did we do it? Because Philips and their American versions thought it would be a great wheeze to persuade uh, Western governments to force everybody to change their light bulbs and buy more expensive ones. You know, what, what the, you know, the, all their Christmases came true, um, uh, basically. And so they, you know, there was lobbying using climate change as the excuse, of course, um, for us to uh, change our light bulbs to that inferior technology. I'm, I'm thinking electric cars at this point. Well, I don't think you're entirely wrong to think electric cars at this point. This is why exactly my worry about this. I guess uh, I did want to talk a little bit about environmentalism more uh, mm. more in general. Um, we've got this, this subject. Well, exactly. <laughs> well, we just, you're just segueing without me here. Uh, <laughs> We've got this net zero idea. I, the year that they want to do it by keeps changing. Um, well, but... it's, it's, it's still 2050 at the moment under the Tories, but obviously the Greens want it by about 2030, probably 20 to 35, I can't remember. Um, and I think Lib Dems and Labour are on board with that as well. But I can't see how that's going to be realistic. I can't see how I... it's going to be realistic to have net zero full stop. Yes, but... is it is it even a worthy, worthy goal? And if it's tried to be forced, what would be the cost? Well, it's a it's a good question. The cost, uh, I mean, the shocking thing about this policy, I was in Parliament at the time, was uh, Theresa May pushed it through as one of the last things she did. Um, and several of us stood up in the Lords and said, hang on, how much is this going to cost? What is your estimate of the cost of this policy? And we got blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, we think it's not going to be very expensive. Well, I'm sorry, where's your calculations? And, the, you know, we knew we knew the Treasury had done a calculation and come to a horrifically high figure, but they didn't want to show it to us. Um, and, the, you know, you can wave your hands and say, well, by 2050, it'll be cheaper. Well, then let's let, wait till then, do it then. You know, so to, to push through a huge transformation of the economy without any idea of how much it was going to cost did seem to me irresponsible. And all the evidence suggests that with existing technologies today, things like home heating and replacing them by these highly inefficient um, uh, ground source heat pumps and things uh, are going to enormously cost uh, the economy and the consumer. So I, I fear, and by being the sort of first and most courageous country in doing this, we're going to make ourselves horrendously uncompetitive. Um, and uh, by the way, Everybody forgets the words, word net. Um, so just imagine, suppose we, I came up with a technology tomorrow that sucked carbon dioxide out of the air and did so pretty cheaply. So I could then say, right, let's continue burning fossil fuels. Let's, let's burn as much coal as we like, gas, oil, because it doesn't matter. I can just suck it out of the air and dump it underground. Um, that might happen at some point in the next 20 or 30 years. 
Um, but of course, the environmentalists would be dead against this. They'd hate the idea that we're still using um, uh, petrol and diesel, uh, even if they've lost the excuse of it adding to carbon dioxide in the air, which you know might, as I say, come about. But that's what net means. You know, it, it, it means that we should be doing net um, zero emissions, not zero mm -hmm. emissions. But we're treating it at the moment as if we we're, we're we've got to solve it at the um, combustion end of the problem rather than elsewhere. Yeah, and that's a weird thing with the environmental activists. They they will start off, but and it's a weird thing about why they're against nuclear, but that's a different issue. But they will start off saying, because I think the Green Party were in favour of carbon capture and storage about a decade ago. And, and now it's, as you say, the, the worst thing imaginable. But now they're against nuclear, which will replace fossil fuels. So what do they want? <laughs> well, in what they want, and I'm afraid this is a fair criticism, they want hair shirt. They want you and I to, to, to cut back on our holidays, cut back on our travel, mm. um, and not have, you know, a second home or, um, yeah. uh, you know, spare bedrooms or something. It's all about forcing austerity on people. It's a form of puritanism. And I think this, this becomes yeah. clear when you, when you do say, look, what if nuclear fission or nuclear fusion suddenly made zero carbon energy uh, cheap and hugely available? Then wouldn't that be fine? We could just go on living uh, lifestyles with, you know, we could each have huge, a huge house if we can yeah. afford it if, or a huge car, um, assuming that the car's fuel was in somehow made by these nuclear energy which would be possible if it was cheap um so uh and, and of course they wouldn't want that you know they, they, they they'd much prefer to stop us driving cars than to have us drive cars that don't produce um uh, emissions which is just very true i mean where, where does that puritanism come from because it's, it's not like they're doing an oliver cromwell and saying it's god's will it, uh, it seems i mean it is the existential threat of the planet burning which from everything I've seen, isn't going to happen. It's certainly not going to be apocalyptic. You know, there's got to be issues, but not ones that we can't really yeah. handle, even under current trends. So, no, I mean, I've been writing about climate change for over in in, yeah. in uh, for over thirty years since I was hmm. science editor of of the Economist, uh, and during that time, we've seen a gentle warming, about half the rate uh, that was predicted in those days. Um, uh, very little effect, uh, no increase in droughts, in fact, a slight decrease, um, no increase in tropical storms, um, either severity or frequency, a huge decrease in the number of people dying of weather-related events because we've got better warnings, better transport, better shelter, and so on. Um, uh, so, uh, yes, it's happening. Um, it's happening about as fast as uh, the more sensible models say, but not as fast as the more bonkers models with huge positive feedbacks in them say, uh, the chances of billions of us starving as a result of it in the next 10 years, like Extinction Rebellion likes to say, are absolutely zero. Because one of the things it's doing is it's increasing the yields of farms. Um, that's measurable. You can see there's been about a 15% increase in um uh, crop yields as a result of extra carbon dioxide in the air. I mean, carbon dioxide is plant food. Uh, you know, there's, there's no doubt about that. There's also a greening going on in, in forests and um, habitats all over the world. Um, so for me, it's not at all clear that climate change is going to be net uh, uh, damaging by 2050 um, and maybe not for quite a long time after that. Uh, so it does seem to me like we are... Um, uh, taking chemotherapy for a cold here. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, another another good analogy. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I've been against environmentalists since my university days because I have a background in geology, and, and even there, the all the lecturers were basically saying, "Don't listen to." <laughs> climate activists they don't really know what they're talking about uh, it was a big issue at the time i was at university uh, with fracking um because we did just have a whole lecture where it was basically right people tell you know these activists will tell you earthquakes are a massive issue with uh with fracking um but no here's the data uh problem is any magnitude below two on size monitors they're really inconsistently uh, recorded that's where most of our um 
information that's where most fracking earthquakes occur under two uh, magnitude on the Richter scale. So we can't even tell if they make more or not. But it's it's right. said as a fact all because of that Blackpool incident. Um, right. And yeah, and and you know it's, it's I mean, point five on the Richter scale was the limit that was set. That. Oh, yeah is the equivalent of someone sitting down hard in a chair in the next room. You know, that, that's the yeah, kind of level it's... of minute tremor we're talking about. It's not an earthquake. It's just a micro tremor. And by the way, if you held other industries to that level, you know, if you said to the mining industry, the quarrying industry, the transport industry, you know, I don't know if you've ever lived near a tube station, but, you know, the significant tremors go through your house every, every time a, a tube train goes past. Um you, you know, those industries are allowed to produce much more than 0. 0.2 or point, uh, sorry, 0.5, 0.5 yeah. or 2. Um, uh, and um, uh, yet fracking was held to this ridiculous level. It, it, it was a grotesquely distorted debate um, um, and, uh, you know, very badly organised. Oh, yeah. And what, what makes it even more odd is, you know, with fracking, you're hydraulically fracturing at, you know, two miles deep with, with the tube, as you say, that's a few meters <laughs> with yeah, uh, exactly. as you say much much higher uh, on the <laughs> richter scale uh, which is a shame because i would have liked a job in the fracking industry but <laughs> i mean it the government can't even make its mind up on that because news came out two three weeks ago that you know they were going to cover up all the old methane holes uh, for fracking but now they're saying don't do that for another year and i imagine that's because of the current energy crisis we're in which um well, i've done an article you know, on the website covering Hmm. Gas prices are five times here what they are in America. Um, that's because of <laughs> fracking in America. Yeah. Um, gas doesn't have a world price like oil because it's very expensive to liquefy it and take it across the ocean. But we're relying on that liquefied gas. If we had gone ahead in the early 2010s with um, shale gas exploration in Lan Lancashire and Yorkshire, and I talked to a Texas um, entrepreneur who's actually got interests in the Lincolnshire part of the polar shale uh, and he said um, we uh, you know we've seen some terrific shales in America the Haynesville the Marcellus particularly well I'm sorry what you've got in England is six times better than the Marcellus our best shale um, in terms of the amount of gas we could get out of it so if we'd gone ahead in the early 2010s we'd have been a major producer of gas for the whole of Europe by now, I suspect. Uh, we'd have had cheap gas at home, which would give us an enormous competitive advantage. It, importing it, uh, we wouldn't have needed to import it, so the, the carbon footprint would be lower, not higher. Um, uh, and yet we were stopped from doing that by um, ridiculous lies, frankly. Um, and they were, you know... They, oh, yeah. Friends of the Earth were actually reprimanded by the Advertising Standards Authority for, for what they said about uh, what uh, fracking might do. Yeah, it, it, it has been an annoying issue for me for about three years. I mean, fracking was the whole reason I started a YouTube channel, just because I saw so many lies about it. And obviously, having just come out of a geology degree, seeing all this news, and it, a lot of reporters don't seem to know what they're talking about on, on any subject. <laughs> Um, that's true quite quite frankly uh, oh, it's amazing how they have jobs like that but I, sh it, I did come to a realisation that their jobs do, do seem to be more make a headline that makes people want to see what you have to say well makes you click on it sorry rather than or buy your paper rather than have anything yeah. too useful or accurate yeah. um, I mean, journalism I has become very much clickbait hasn't it because, because yeah. of the collapse of advertising revenue or whatever yeah, which uh, obviously our articles in the Wellington Project, we do try and avoid. <laughs> as much as we can. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, environmentalism is definitely a pet peeve of mine. And I do keep an eye on the Greens and Extinction Rebellion quite closely. I've even got the handbook from Extinction Rebellion that's about 150 pages long. And uh, I think only one of the articles in there, or one of the sections in there is written by someone who... I think he lived in Malaysia or something, and you know he, he seems to have natural disasters affecting him, and he did have to move. Um, but uh, but that that's obviously one anecdotal, um, you know, relatively sad. But the, the rest of it's all things from Caroline Lucas or people from Extinction Rebellion. And I, I don't know if you know this, but Roger Hallam, who create who found co-founded Extinction Rebellion, 
he had a or, organic farm in South Wales, um, and he blames climate change for that for those crops failing. But obviously, if you're organically farming, you don't use pesticides, you don't use anything. It's more likely to fail. Uh, but he was the only organic farmer in Wales to fail that year. Which, how you can blame that then on climate change, I have no idea. But <laughs> um, and by the way, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, yeah. Sri Lanka um, brought in mandatory organic farming about a year or two ago, and it's been an absolute catastrophe. It's the reason that their economies collapsed uh, and so on, oh, wow. um, uh, and and they're getting really hungry and so on. So, so mm. you know, it's been tried yeah. now organic farming, and and if you know, if we were to use organic farming throughout the world. We would need, as a, as we said earlier, twice as much land, more than twice as much land to feed mm -hmm. the, the world. There isn't that much land out there. I mean, we'd have to chop down all the rainforests, drain all the marshes, um, irrigate as much of the yeah. desert as we could, and we'd still be hungry, and there'd be no room for nature. It's very clear now, from all the work that conservationists do, um, that uh, uh, the more we can produce from an acre, uh, the fewer acres we need, and the more acres we can give back to nature. Um, uh, I'm a you know, I am an environmentalist. I'm a passionate environmentalist. I spend a lot of my time you know, on nature conservation projects and things mm. uh, in my spare time. And I, I worked actually as a professional on bird conservation projects in India and Pakistan in my youth. Um, but I do not believe uh, that uh, the recipe from Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth or, or Extinction Rebellion is the right recipe. I think they've got, got it backwards. I think they're the ones who would do real harm to the environment. And yet they're the ones listened to the most, unfortunately. Right. That, yeah. that is a question that I have, is why, why are they listened to that much? If they're that catastrophically wrong, why do people listen to them? Um, because uh, pessimism sells. Um, uh, the more you can make it sound like there's an apocalyptic threat, the more money people send you. Um, that's kind of always been true, You're going back to you know doom and gloom preachers of the 17th century, I suspect. Um, so... Uh, it it it's it, it it just you know um, they really don't like good news because it they don't think it helps raise money. I actually think that they ought to try it occasionally. I mean, I think conservationists should occasionally say, "Look, there were five thousand humpback whales in the world uh, in the nineteen sixties, and everyone thought they were going extinct. Now there are eighty thousand, sixteen times as many. That's a success story." If you give us conservationist money, we will make more success stories. But they never use that argument. They always say, um, uh, oh, there's such and such species is, is about to go extinct, so you've got to give us money to save that. Why not say, here are our successes, and we could make more of these successes? That's the By only the way, thing... The more... Go on. Sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say yeah, the reason right. I think for that is um, when people hear the story of here's a success, it's like, well, you don't need my money then. <laughs> I guess that's the only psychological reason something. I can think of. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> they're very good businessmen, these people. You know, I mean, we've been rude about them, but, you know, they're running mm. uh, extremely large, you know, Friends of the Earth, um, oh, yeah. uh, World Wildlife Fund and, and Greenpeace are between them billion dollar multinational corporations uh, in terms of annual revenue um, that you know if you add up their annual revenue the three of them it comes collectively to a billion dollars these are huge multinational businesses um, they're very successful they know exactly how to raise money they have the advantage over other multinational businesses they don't actually have to produce a product the product they produce is fear um, uh, which enables them to raise more money so it's a, it's a great gig if you can get it well, if you can't get a gig in fracking, Harry, then that's where you need to go. Right? <laughs> I swear I'm going to have to go. I'm going to have to be anti-fracking eventually. <laughs> right, well, I think on that, we're probably going to draw this to a close. Uh, Harry, do you have anything else to add before we do that? Uh, no, just thank you very much for having me on. It's been a good conversation. Yeah, Matt, anything from yourself? Thank you very much for having me on. Great fun uh, and enjoyed talking to you. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. It's been good for me as well. So thank you to all our listeners. And uh, Owen's told me to say, uh, what was it? Good evening, good morning and good night. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> Got it.